clinical um, thing about semimembranosis or something that it brings up is one of the authors that I often talk about who is Van der Waal. Has anybody read Van der Waal's work on um, the way that joints are formed and the way that articulations are um, in parallel and not in series? Has anybody ever read these articles? Okay. So what Van der Waal discusses is the fact that, just like we've been saying, there's no direct insertions of muscles to bones, especially when we're talking about at articulations. So the, it's not like you have a layer of capsule and then a layer of passive ligaments that stabilize the joint and then a layer of muscles whose fascia cross the joint. It's not like they're arranged in that, that, that kind of layered or tiered fashion. So in other words, the idea that there is a passive um, ligament that stabilizes the knee, for example, only passively is false. There are no passive stabilizers because the way that muscles kind of continue across articulations is such that the muscle will kind of blend in to the capsule, which is part of the ligaments, which will then blend with muscles on the other side of the articulation. Okay? So if you were to dissect, let's say, the lateral elbow, you wouldn't see the extensor carpi radialis brevis making a direct insertion into the lateral condyle. You would see it making an insertion into a conjoined tendon ligament capsule impossible to distinguish that would then be continuous with the muscles across the other side of the joint. So what does that mean? In the knee it would mean that the thing that is blocking valgus stress isn't the MCL. It's all of the muscles on the inside of the leg which will insert into a connective tissue relay system of stuff which will then follow with the muscles in the lower limb. So you can almost think of ligaments not as passive stabilizers but as active stabilizers because the muscles control their tension. Now why is that important? It's important because if we only had passive stabilizers for articulations, you would only be stable in particular uh, ranges of motion. And other ranges of motion, when those tissues become lax, you would have no stability in that joint. What does what that also mean? That also gives us a really good opportunity because in terms of rehab, when we're thinking about stabilization, it's almost just safe to say that if you wanted to stabilize the medial aspect of the knee, you would be training all contractile tissue on the medial aspect of the knee and the medial aspect of the leg because all of this tissue will combine with all of this tissue as one continuous tissue. So the activity of the um, muscular, of the muscles on either side of the articulations will be what guide the tension of those quote unquote passive stabilizers. Okay? Does that make, does that make sense? Further, if you take the idea of a passive stabilizer, that means that the stabilizer can only provide afferent information in certain joint angles. Because when you're at a particular joint angle and the passive stabilizer is lax, you would no longer be getting any real proprioceptive information from that tissue. But now that we know that the ligaments are active and can join with and join with the muscles, when muscles have tension, there's automatically going to be tension in those ligaments. So we're going to continuously get afferent information from the ligaments as well as from the capsules. And that's important because we talked about yesterday the fact that capsules are one of our richest sources of mechanoreception. What it also means is that if we stretch properly, okay, using the techniques that we've talked about, we talked briefly about stuff like uh, progressive angular isometric loading, regressive angular isometric loading, uh, FRC principles, what that means is that when you're stretching and loading your stretch positions, you're also loading the capsules and the ligaments at a slightly lengthened position. Okay? Going back to the, the rule of progressive adaptation that we discussed, that means that as we're stretching the capsules slightly, we're contracting, so we're putting load and force into the capsules, we're getting the capsules and the ligaments used to being at a lengthened position, and we're strengthening them as they're getting lengthened. So that means that the type of stretching that we do is not going to produce unstable joints, but it will improve the stability of the joint as you increase the mobility. Okay? So 
a joint that's flexible isn't necessarily healthy, but a healthy joint is necessarily mobile. In other words, if you, you can have um, stability and mobility that occur at the same time. And that's why you have athletes like um, the Cirque du Soleil performers and the gymnasts who at very extreme ranges of motion are perfectly stable. They're not dislocating joints. People often ask when gymnasts are on the rings and they're doing all of these flips and their arm is going into abduction external rotation, why, isn't there, there, why aren't they dislocating their shoulder? It's because they've got to that point with progressive adaptation. So their shoulder is perfectly prepared to be in these bad positions. It's people who don't prepare themselves to be in these positions who end up having the problems. And Vanderwall's work kind of gives us the, the, the concept as to why that is.